Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Friday. Time for the weekend. I am ready. Hope you guys are too. Today, we're going to finish up the police interviews with Jeff Lacasse, which is Wendy Adelson's ex-boyfriend. And then we're going to hop into the first of a few emails that Donna Adelson sent to Wendy during the divorce where they're trying to get back at Dan some really bitter stuff. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you haven't, like the video, share it with your friends. I appreciate you. Thanks to everybody who's donated and bought merch. You guys rock. Music fact of the day. What are three songs that were written within 30 minutes or less that became huge hits? The Rolling Stones, I Can't Get No Satisfaction, REM, Losing My Religion, and the Beastie Boys, you got to fight for your right to party. We're going to finish up with these interviews today. We left off with Jeff saying that Wendy changed her profile picture the day before Dan's murder to a picture that was really good of Wendy, but not so great of the boys. Jeff kind of theorized that if Wendy knew she was going to be in the media, this would be the picture she would want. I looked all over to try to find out what picture he was referring to. The general consensus is, if you're on YouTube, this one here. I've been showing it really since the beginning of the series. It's Wendy sitting on the couch with the boys, and they're kind of tucked into both sides. The one thing about Jeff that I love, and I, I really like this guy. He's an open book. He's obviously very good at what he does in his line of work because he pegged these people really from the first minute he sat down in that first police interview just a few days after Dan was shot and killed. I've also watched some of his testimony at Charlie Adelson's trial, and this dude pays attention to detail. I'm going to tell you guys, I was thinking about Jeff's police interviews and how he is so on top of dates. And then it just reminded me, if I ever have to sit in a police interview room and tell them what I was doing a month ago, I'm screwed because I just can't remember stuff like that. So we pick up on July 23rd, 2014. We're still in that second interview. He said he thought it was strange that Wendy had not contacted him about Dan being shot. He said he and Wendy co-parented the boys for six months. They talked about Dan for hundreds of hours over the course of their relationship, and yet Wendy did not call him in the days after Dan's murder. He also thinks that it's odd about the no contact request from Wendy he tells investigators, you know, I know you guys said not to take it personally. He said, I'm not. We're done. He said, it just looks guilty to me. Maybe she's a cold-blooded, damaged, needy woman that decided she was done with me. But if there's any interest in Wendy at all, there's a lot of sociopathic stuff there. A little spoiler alert before we get to the trial stuff, and it's kind of hinted to here, Jeff really felt like Wendy was trying to set him up to be the suspect in Dan's murder. Jeff said he would have stepped in front of a truck for Wendy, and he says that having two boyfriends at the same time shows a lack of conscience, and also it was just really easy for her to lie to him, and it makes him think that he hopes Wendy's not involved. And the investigator says that as of now, it does not look like she's involved, but time will tell. That was the end of that second interview. The third interview came on March 6, 2015, just under eight months after Dan was shot. Jeff says that when he first spoke to investigators, he was just shattered. He said when he talked before, he thinks he came across as just a disgruntled ex-boyfriend, but over time, he's gotten some clarity thinking about things. He said Wendy moving back to Miami was the best thing that ever happened to him. So at this point, Wendy's back in Miami, and you can tell Jeff's really had time to chew on this. His demeanor is a little bit different. He's just a little more relaxed in that police interview room this third go-round. He wants to go over some things he saw and heard that are suspicious now, just in hindsight, having some time to decompress and really think about things leading up to the murder. He said in the fall, Danny had started describing Wendy as a pathological liar and a mentally ill narcissistic sociopath, kind of in a joking manner to other people, Jeff said he heard that through the grapevine, just came from secondhand sources. But people did tell Jeff to be careful with Wendy because people thought she was a little bit unbalanced. He knew she was really upset about the divorce, but he didn't really take anything like that seriously at the time. At the time, Dan seemed out of line to Jeff, and that's why Jeff was just upset with him. Dan went after Wendy in a very aggressive way, and he said it seemed that way not knowing the background and how this all played out. Again, you tell people what you want them to hear. 
and then you stop there. He said by May of 2014, Jeff knew what Dan was talking about regarding Wendy that she's a very troubled person. Jeff said that Wendy is gorgeous, she's funny, she's smart, and he said, I fell for her like a ton of bricks most men would. But his overall impression of her, she's very manipulative, she's a pathological liar. He said in the time they were together, she was an alcoholic. He said she drank her dinner most nights. On the other hand, she was extremely fragile and extremely depressed. We know she didn't hide the fact that she hated being in Tallahassee. Wendy thought people that lived in Tallahassee were a bunch of country bumpkins. There's nothing wrong with country bumpkins. Two conversations they had every single day for nine months they were together. Danny is an evil monster, and Tallahassee is the worst place in the world to live. Wendy said, I can't believe I got stuck here because of Danny Markell. She was obsessed with those two concepts, constantly a topic of conversation. It has to get old. See, I couldn't listen to that every day for nine months. I would be like, girl, you need to move on and just let this go. He said she plays the victim very easily, and whenever they got into a confrontation, it was all poor me. He said he works with domestic violence victims, so it was easy to manipulate him, or Danny for that matter, into feeling sorry for her. He said she wasn't stable even in the fall before they really became exclusive but she could cover it up very well. He said the first 100 hours in spending with Wendy, you're like, wow, she's amazing. And then 101 hours in, you're like, what did I get myself into? This girl's crazy. He said there's just this really strange dynamic between Wendy and her brother, Charlie. He gives this story. It's very disturbing. Um, he said Charlie went to a Korean wedding, and he was the only person there, apparently, who was not Korean. This led to him getting sucker punched. And as punishment to his date that brought him was to punish her sexually, and then he bragged about it. Jeff said that Charlie told him this 20 minutes after meeting for the first time. That would be awkward. In May of 2014, back to that coffee shop incident where Jeff came in, saw Wendy was there with Daniel, he says he thinks there were maybe five to 10 other men in Wendy's life within this time frame, kind of like a revolving door. He said it's not a crime, but Wendy's also very compulsive. She's erratic. She doesn't think things through. She does things, but she doesn't really think about the consequences that could come. After they had that fight in Gainesville, where Jeff just confronted her about cheating, he said Wendy went to Portland for a weekend and then came back. He said, now at this point, it's June of 2014. And he said by that time, he's starting to talk to his friends and tell them, look, something's just going on with her. He said that he and Wendy had a very frank discussion, but ultimately they decided to stay together. Together. Wendy told Jeff that it was one guy and he had moved out of the area. He talks about a trip to California that he and Wendy had planned to go see Jeff's parents the week that Danny was killed. The dates for that trip were July 11th through the 19th. And in early June, she rescheduled the trip, said she couldn't go. Jeff wanted to know what the problem with the trip was. And Wendy said, I'm worried that we'll get stuck in an airport and we won't be back on Friday. Friday being the day Dan was shot. She said, I have to pick the kids up from school. Jeff told her, we're actually coming back Thursday night. It's not winter. In worst case scenario, we could rent a car. We have friends who can babysit. He said it was just really strange in hindsight why she was so adamant she had to be back by that Friday. So ultimately, Jeff said, that's fine. We'll just cancel the trip. He said he told her, if you don't feel comfortable right now, that's cool. Just tell me, meeting his parents. Wendy says, no, I have to pick up the kids from school that day. I just have to. She said she wanted to spend that week with him before he went to Tennessee. And then he asked her, would you like maybe to go to St. Augustine? Because she loves the beach. And Wendy said she wanted to do this staycation in Tallahassee. So he's like, you want to stay in Tallahassee on the hottest week of the year? And by the way, you hate it here. And Wendy said, we could go to the park. He said, look, I'm just offering to take you away. Why wouldn't you accept that? Because Wendy would leave town every chance she got. He did convince her to take that trip to St. Augustine. But again, she had to be back by Friday. He said when they were trying to look at these dates and deciding where to go, Wendy had her calendar out. The other thing that he said that kind of confused him is that she wouldn't have needed to pick the kids up till about 4 p.m. Jeff said Wendy was the type of person you had to schedule everything with her. She was scheduling other things, but there was just a weird about that particular week. Jeff said that the day Danny was shot, it was a day that was just weird to him even before the shooting because she was just so adamant on being back that day. 
She canceled plans all the time and would reschedule them, but usually it made sense and none of this did. Wherever they decided to go, Jeff was supposed to come back with Wendy on that Friday and then start his trip to Tennessee. His plan was to drive to Atlanta and spend the night just to break the trip up. His friends actually, after the murder, said to him, can you imagine if you had left at 11 a.m. on Friday? This would have looked like you were a huge suspect because he said he's a late sleeper. And also the route he would have taken to get to the interstate would have been fairly close to Dan's house. He said, Wendy knew when I was going to leave. He said, I'm glad I changed my plans, obviously. He said, if you guys had seen me driving north about 10 minutes after Danny was shot, you would have been way more suspicious of me. He said in June, they had a really good family life as far as their interactions with the boys, but a terrible romantic life because she was cheating. He said, but four to five times in late June, he was playing with the kids, reading them stories, and out of the corner of his eye, he would see Wendy in the kitchen just crying for no reason. Looking back, it's almost like she was taking all this in and kind of grieving, like she was wrestling with something. Now, in June, if you remember, that was that failed attempt. Sigfredo and Luis Rivera came up from Miami to Tampa, but the rental car company flagged their location. It was supposed to be a local rental. This is the time frame where he noticed that she was doing this upset in the kitchen crying and she would never tell him why. He kind of theorizes maybe she knew what was coming or what was supposed to happen. He said, I think if a person knows something is going to happen, maybe that's how you would react. In June, she talked about not being able to relocate to Miami. She said, I got stuck here. Can't stand it. I did not choose this. So Jeff would ask her about them and say, look, two years down the road, if you could move, what about us? And she said, the only way I can relocate is if something happened to Danny. It would be a tough decision to leave Jeff, but she said she would probably have to go to Miami to be with her parents. He said that Danny got job offers from all over the country all the time. Wendy did not want to live in some of the places he got offered jobs, which included St. Louis and Houston. Wendy and Dan had a lot of court things going on between January and March of 2014, and she would just be so mad all the time at Danny. The judge read Danny at one point the riot act and told Danny's lawyer that he needed to calm Dan down and have him stop writing his own legal briefs because he was ultimately just sick of reading them. You get a lawyer for a client. I get it. He said, but really, Danny had started to calm down a lot. He really liked his new girlfriend. And he told Wendy, you know, maybe you could just talk about Danny a little less. He said he's just very different now. He's kind of chill. This is a good thing. Jeff was being very rational, you know, pointing out that they have kids in common. You're kind of stuck with Danny. And the best way to move forward is just to change how you think about him. She said, you know, Charlie looked into how much it would cost to have him killed. $15,000. He wasn't sure if it was 15 or 50. He testifies to that in court. So in June, out of nowhere, he said that Wendy starts manipulating him. She throws him the world. His friends is like, why is she stringing you along if ultimately she doesn't think this is going to work? He said that in June, she's telling him you should move in. And he said, I wanted a family so bad. And she knew that. So she manipulated me with the kids constantly. She said the kids should call him dad. Wendy said, I'm going to give you all my passwords. I'm going to talk to my parents because Jeff's not Jewish. And that was a big problem with the oldest brother when he was dating a woman that wasn't. He said Wendy just overall acted like the two of them were going to be a permanent thing. On that June 27th work trip to Gainesville, this is when he confronted her. He said that he totally lost it verbally on her, never touched her. He said that she just decompensated in a way he had never seen an adult act. She ended up in the fetal position, just sobbing like a three-year-old. He also says, you may see in an email from her, she was so manipulative about that event that he ended up apologizing to her. The investigator asked if that email would be in her Gmail account, and he said, yeah. The investigator says those have been looked at, so he would just go back and try to figure out which one that Jeff was referring to. He said, looking back, he didn't really think that Wendy necessarily wanted a boyfriend, Jeff said, it was more that I was really helpful with the kids and Wendy liked that. The investigator kind of wants to narrow down this timeline a little bit. And he says, so on June 27th, you're in Gainesville. You have the blow up. Did the comment about Charlie hiring a hitman come before or after that weekend? And Jeff said, after. Jeff said he's almost positive that comment came the Monday before Dan was shot. The investigator says he's a bit confused because his impression was when Jeff came in for this third interview that he was going to crucify Wendy and say, 
she's directly involved. The investigator said, you know, not necessarily that Wendy pulled the trigger, but maybe she solicited somebody to. Jeff said, I still believe that. I'm 90% sure when I talked to you guys in July, I was waiting for you to catch someone, you know, then maybe I'm crazy. And my theory of it being Charlie hiring a hitman isn't the case. The investigator brings in the email where Wendy wants that one week no contact. It was July 15th, which was the Tuesday before the murder. Now, just for reference, she had told Jeff about Charlie looking into hiring a hitman the day before on the 14th. Jeff talks about being at yoga. They leave. They go to their cars and say goodbye. He's about 10 paces away from her going to his car. And Wendy yells out, hey, Jeff, are you still going to Tennessee on Friday? He told her it's up in the air. And he said he hoped she was going to ask him to say goodbye to the kids the next day, just to kind of resolve that if they're not going to be together. But he said she was deeply interested about his trip. She asked three or four questions just strictly about that trip. Under what circumstances would he go? Why am I thinking about not going? And he said it was just so bizarre. If we're not going to be together, why is she so worried about what I'm doing on Friday? Which goes back to his theory that maybe Wendy was trying to set this up to look like Jeff was the one that shot Dan. He said that that conversation that they had in that parking lot was about an hour before he got that no contact email. He said, we had just spent 14 days away from each other thinking about things, and then I get this email. They read part of the email out loud. It said, it pains me writing this to you, but here we go. I need some space to clear my head and to figure out how to move forward. I'm heart sick, but my head and my heart are having two different reactions to us being together, and I can't reconcile them to be in this like you would want me to be. I don't know if there's more to that email. That's all the investigator read. But the investigator essentially questions, like, why didn't you press her when she said that Charlie looked into hiring a hitman? He said, you get used to Wendy's crazy. She's all over the place all the time. Jeff was asked, what was the picture before? She changed it. And he said, just really any normal 35-year-old mom of two Facebook picture. Wendy did not contact Jeff for 10 days after the murder. She told him that police said he was a suspect and not to return the text he sent her when he reached out. She told people in her social circles that she was concerned Jeff was the one that shot Dan and they shouldn't contact him. He said he did talk to her three or four times after the murder, and he made note of some strange things she said. One comment, I love Tallahassee. I wanted to remain in Tallahassee for the rest of my life. She said, Danny has so many enemies, it will be impossible to figure out who did this. Jeff said that, Dan was a pretty beloved guy, and even though he was abrasive, he started to realize after the murder and that separation from Wendy that this monster Wendy created really wasn't who Dan was. He said one other thing that really stood out is he never heard any sympathy for Danny. She still seems enraged, obsessed, and even defiant about Danny. He tells of a time where Wendy and Charlie went to dinner about three weeks after the murder. According to Jeff, Charlie called this a celebration dinner. And he said that was in text. So he tells the investigator, you can pull up the text if you want. Now, I watched some of Wendy's testimony last night as well from Charlie's trial, and she denied it was ever called that. I haven't got to the point where if they validated it was called a celebration dinner or not. At this dinner, apparently, Wendy just vomited all over the table in the restaurant. This was after Charlie made some comment to her, but Wendy did not tell Jeff what the comment was. She told him that the kids were having problems, but not because of Danny's murder. He said that was odd. He said that Wendy was really upset that he attended Danny's memorial service, and he also said a local newspaper put it front and center that he attended. So he said he puts all this together and just comes to the conclusion that she was aware that Dan was going to be shot. And he thinks somehow she's probably involved in it. The investigator asked if Wendy still has the same phone as the time Dan was shot. And Jeff said she actually changed the phone three or four days after the murder because she thought law enforcement were bugging her phone. The investigator literally laughs out loud. And he asked Jeff, do you have the new number? He said, no, she didn't change the number. She just got a new phone. Jeff said that was a real big concern of Wendy's. She told Jeff 50 times, I had nothing to do with this, which is kind of what we saw in her police interview. We did the count. I think it got up to 10 or more where she constantly says, I can see why you think I'd be the suspect. And I think Wendy was needing this constant validation from the investigators that Adam was shot, that she wasn't on their radar 
which is why she asked so much, probably not realizing she brought herself into that as often as she did. Jeff said, you know, it's not like there's a serial killer targeting Jewish lawyers. Dan's murder was targeted. The investigator says that Wendy says she's concerned for her and her kids' safety, and Jeff said that Wendy plays the victim really, really well. He said everybody felt bad for Wendy after this, and I thought, to myself, holy crap, she's involved. The last time he talked to her was in August of 2014. He said Wendy was mostly upset that she had to cancel her commencement speech since Danny was shot. That was the thing she was most upset about, about everything in the world, not that her kids lost their dad or that Dan had been shot and died as a result of that. Her attorney told her she didn't need to put herself in front of the media because Inside Edition is going to show up. He said Wendy was devastated. She didn't get to speak at commencement. That was it for Jeff's three interviews. I kind of condensed it down to where we're just not repeating things he said. Um, these interviews can get repetitive. We're going to go through one of the emails that Donna sent to Wendy. Now, Donna calls Danny what I assume to be a derogatory name. I'm not going to repeat it. This was sent on Friday, May the 3rd of 2013. So this is over a year before Dan is shot and killed. The subject, information regarding his memorandum of law email. Then it says, Dear Wendy, okay, just saw this email this morning. Obviously, his 23-page rant was insufficient, so he's trying to push the court to deny hearing your petition. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if to prevent any action, your attorney must respond or not. Only you and she know that. However, Dan has made his divorce a full-time job to attempt to get what he's always gotten, his way. His job allows for lots of time for him to put into this project. And you know as well as I do that all the research he's done on different case law to prove his point in his research, his job allows for lots of time for him to put into this project. And you know as well as I do that all the research he's done on different case law to prove his point is his research, not his attorney's. No matter who did it, he is quoting 13 cases to show why the court should basically throw out your petition. Is Kristen answering this? She underlines this next part. Does it require an answer to make sure that this is not seen by the court as ignoring his rights? I don't know. You need to find out. She goes on to say, the most important part of your divorce is relocation. I sincerely hope your attorney understands that that is your non-negotiable. Lots of things are negotiable. That's the one thing you cannot let her think, okay, well, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. She needs to hear from you how serious you are about this and how it will benefit the children with a close-knit family support system, as well as your significantly better paying job with hours much more flexible than your current job, so that you can spend significantly more time with the children, which requires teaching hours, office hours, court appearances, meeting with med school people, and multiple trips away from home. Those trips need to be coordinated with a very angry man who will not be cooperative with you you in this regard. For example, this past weekend, you had your annual conference for, and it's blank, but it's underlined. At the same time, his regular NYU crap was taking place. He didn't say, I go to NYU every month, and this is your annual meeting. I'll stay with the children and you go. Of course not. Danny thinks he's a very important person. And as always, he and his needs come first. So she underlines this next part. Without your parents as backup, one of you would have to stay home with the children. She says, your attorney needs to understand that you're mother worked full-time in the family's dental practice until September when she felt she was needed by you or the well-being of the children to get them through a transitional time with people who love them, see them frequently, and with whom they share great affection. Your father has made numerous trips by plane for weekends and changing the patient schedules around so that he can continue to spend significant time with the children. Both the disappearance of your mother from the position of office manager and the disappearance of your father from the practice for a significant amount of time has caused a decrease in the practice income and the loss of some patients who feel it's either not being run the same way as when my mother was there full time or that my father is unable to see patients with problems and has referred them to other offices during his absence. Additionally, this loss of income affects my family because my older brother, also a dentist, purchased the practice from my father in mid-July 2012. He has a monthly payment to make to my father based on the sale of the practice. It isn't fair to him to have decreasing monthly income statements from the practice 
due to my parents spending so much time here in Tallahassee. My brother is unmarried and is a wonderful uncle to Benjamin and Lincoln. If I'm able to relocate to South Florida, they will have an incredibly warm and loving family as an integral part of their lives, not an occasional two-day weekend trip to visit. This is the most selfish stuff. This is so toxic. Everything in that paragraph revolved around them. Not one bit of concern for the children having a meaningful relationship with their father. It it's really just gross. Then there's a section called response and it says brief background. This is a no fault divorce state. So his nonsense about no marital infidelity or abuse doesn't matter. However, a hot temper and verbal abuse is what you need to emphasize that you suffered under his reign. Narcissistic personality disorder causes major problems in a marriage, especially when one believes that because he attended Harvard undergrad and Harvard law, he's clearly better and smarter than anyone else, including you. She puts in parentheses, only an idiot like him would write that he should be the only one consulted for making decisions regarding the health, education, and religion of his children. Clearly, no one, including you, is as smart as he is in those regards. The money you moved into an account for you was exactly half to the penny of the joint account, which is marital assets. The furniture you took was the bare minimum. A bed for you to sleep on from the guest bedroom, one nightstand, and your dresser. You took two chairs that you bought five years ago at a neighborhood furniture store's closeout sale for $50 each. You have receipts to show all the new furniture you purchased to relocate to a safe place. You absolutely must emphasize that the only reason you left when he was out of town is because of the threat. You will leave without your children, without a penny, and just the clothes on your back. It's super important for the judge to get the message that this guy is a big bully. I know she'll be able to read that when you submit copies of some of the emails he sent you. He feels if he said something, that's it. Well... That's not it. He said, you did this while he was on a short business trip. How about how many trips to conferences, et cetera, this man has taken? How much time away from his family? You have all those documented. Now, you need to sit down and figure out how many days away that's been. How about adding to that all his two-week trips to Israel, especially when you were at the end of your pregnancy? Sweet, caring, concerned husband. He talks about not knowing where the children were, incorrect address for the first six weeks. Let the court know that although he was never particularly interested in the children prior to the divorce, he was advised to keep a diary and make sure he shows his interest now. You arranged to meet him the very next day with Alan and Lynn, mutual friends, and the children at a local yogurt shop so that he could see the children were fine. You were in fear of his temper, and so you did not want to reveal your address. However, four days after the separation, you arranged to bring the children to his house as his parents were going to be in town, and they were there for the Rosh Hashanah holiday with them. The following week, on one of his uninvited treks to your office after he threatened you with federal kidnapping charges, which of course now he recants like he does anything he can't believe he actually did, you gave him your address. That was one week after separation, not six weeks. He says you took non-marital assets. What? He says the children were three and one at the time this took place. Ben was three and Lincoln was 23 months, one month before his second birthday. That would be one year old, Donna. He talks about you both being well-paid professionals with stable jobs. Yours is not a 10-year track job. And with the economy as it is, there's no guarantee it will be there in the future. His trash talking to various faculty members about your mental instability has also poisoned your work environment, making it extremely difficult for you to continue to function there in the same way as you previously did. Your job also pays you half of what his job pays. So on your own, it's not feasible to continue to live even in the home you are currently renting. You have borrowed a considerable amount of money from your parents and must repay it for furniture legal fees, moving expenses, etc. My parents have paid all grocery bills up to this point for which I will also have to reimburse them. I do not want to dip into the money from our marital account as that will have to go towards supporting my children and for their future. According to Dan, the relocation must show that the current arrangement for the children is deficient from the perspective of the children and that relocation would advance their interests. This is something we have reviewed numerous times in other papers, Wendy. Review all that we've put together in this regard rather than have me repeat it. Obviously, the number one reason is significantly more income for you in a job that will also give you significantly more time with the children. 
For children at this tender age, nothing is more important than spending quality time with them, which your current job does not permit. The financial freedom which will accompany this job will allow you to provide educational and outside activities and lessons for the boys that would not be affordable under your current salary. Number two, the ability for our children to spend quality time with my parents and my mother, a retired elementary school teacher, would be a huge bonus to our children's academic and social progress. In my parents' home, each child currently has and would continue to have their own rooms with appropriate beds, furniture, books, and toys. Mr. Markell has become a religious zealot over the last few years since the birth of our first son, taking him to synagogue with him as an infant so that he can absorb the music and the prayers. He has done the same with our second son. This is also to show the congregation what an attentive father he is. The fact remains that the children are watched by teenage children of other congregants in a sort of a playroom while the services are going on. Mr. Markell picks one of them up to come back out at certain parts of the service to hear particular hymns and then returns them to the care of babysitters. This is done rather than allowing them to remain home with me. When I protested, he insisted. He always gets his way. There are no Hebrew day schools in Tallahassee. Mr. Markell seems intent upon religious training, but feels that only he could provide the best religious training for our children. He is indoctrinating them, not teaching them. If he truly cared about a religious school for them, then clearly one of the 37 Hebrew day schools in Dade, Broward and Palm Beach County would be a better choice for our boys. My home in Broward County is close to many of these schools in Midway between Dade and Palm Beach schools. I hope your attorney is researching cases when relocation was granted and what the circumstances were. Also, all cases are different and because one case didn't allow it doesn't mean that should prevent another case from receiving that benefit. Danny has said on numerous occasions, one I have on my phone as a saved message, what wonderful grandparents and in-laws we've been. He knows that the children are very close to us and we'd always be there to take care of them. What's going to happen in June when he wants to go to three different conferences? Don't let him go. If you do, you're enabling and facilitating your stay in Tallahassee. You'll be showing him that anytime he has a meeting he wants to go to, that's fine. You'll watch the boys. That's the whole point of relocation for you and the children. He can continue to attend all the meetings he wants to go to and then arrange for frequent and extended visitation with the boys. Maybe some of the money he spends on his trips could be used to visit the boys. Another bribe to get him to allow relocation should be the offer of plane tickets since he does have family that would allow him to use their homes to stay in. But obviously, that's a last-ditch effort if all else fails. He's trying to show the court that your request is frivolous and that you should have to pay for yours and his court costs in this plea. Your lawyer has to let the court know that it's anything but frivolous. And, and isn't he also supposed to pay some of your legal fees? This bastard has not paid one cent towards your bridge gap alimony. Why? Why only two months of a child support payment over an eight-month time frame? Loving, caring father... That he is. Do you need info on grocery bills? I have a good many of them and can show the court what it's been costing just for that, with no support from Dan. Also, find out from Kristen if she wants you to pay us back now or wait. What's best for your case? I'm too angry to write any more. I'm going to shower, wash my hair, and get ready for you and the boys to come home. Dad said he'd look up any papers tonight or over the weekend that you may need. He even has the information on what Danny had in his IRA and 401k prior to marriage. Love you, mom. That is the most unhinged, obsessed grandmother I think I've seen besides Angela Wagner. It's just ridiculous. The amount of energy she exerts into these emails will blow your mind. And these are just emails. Can't imagine what went on behind the scenes over the telephone, text messages. They were obsessed and consumed with these grandkids. So that's it for today. On the next episode, we'll be reading through three more, maybe four more emails. I'm going to look and see if there are more out there. It's a bit of a scavenger hunt sometimes with this case being almost 10 years old to find things, but I'm getting there. We're chipping away at the main story, but we're kind of backtracking now. We're going to go see what led up to the murder, because that's really what it's about is the motive. You know, and I've done so many cases where a parent gets killed and it's over child custody. It's the most selfish thing you can do for three reasons. Number one, you're taking a parent away from the children 
And then the child is left with one parent. Number two, you're probably going to get caught at some point. In this case, it was very slow to get there for the Adelsons with Charlie just being arrested last year, found guilty just last month. Donna just arrested, awaiting her turn. We'll see about Wendy, but in number three, the burden that they put on these kids because kids grow up. In fact, Benjamin and Lincoln are teenagers now. Either they've just heard one side of this story for so many years that that is their reality, but social media is out there and at some point they may want to hear the truth about what happened. And you're putting a burden on them that their father was shot and killed ultimately for them. It is such a messed up way to think about things. You're doing this for the kids, but really you're ruining their lives. I think when you're so obsessed, you're totally blind to the consequences long term of your actions. You know, it was a couple of years after Dan was murdered before uh, Sigfredo was arrested, then you had Luis get arrested, and then eventually Katie. I bet when those arrests started happening, I would say they maybe had two years of being really comfortable that maybe they got away with this, but when that first arrest happened, they had to have known it was going to be like dominoes, just one after the other would fall. So that's it for today. We will see you next week for a new episode. I hope you guys have a great rest of your evening and a good weekend. We'll see you soon.